Father, we do acknowledge that you are greater than he who is in the world, Lord. And we thank you so much, God, for this beautiful morning that you've blessed us with. Another opportunity for us as your people to gather together and to be in your presence and to hear directly as we study the word of God this morning. And so, Father, it's at this time we're asking that you begin to prepare the soil of our hearts for the going forth of your word. And as always, we thank you in advance for all the amazing works that you're going to accomplish in our lives that's going to bring you glory and honor. And so, God, we dedicate this service over to you. Would you be glorified? In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Well, good morning to everyone, and I uh, also want to extend a warm welcome to those of you watching online and tuning in over the radio. So glad you guys can join us for today. So uh, in terms of our announcements, uh, this morning we have a guest speaker. Pastor Art's going to be bringing us the word this morning, so we're very excited and looking forward to uh, what the Lord's put upon your heart to share with us. So thank you guys for being here. And then uh, if you guys remember, right after the service, if you're able to come back, we do have a baptism and a barbecue taking place. So you don't want to miss out on that. And then uh, next Sunday is Daylight Savings. And so one hour backwards. So don't forget to set your clocks. And uh, later on in that evening uh, at 6 p.m., Instead of uh, home fellowship, we're actually going to be taking the time to get together as a fellowship and uh, take time to pray on behalf of our nation and for the upcoming elections. And that's going to be at 6 p.m. next Sunday. So if you are available, definitely encourage you to come on out and join us for that. And then that Tuesday, November 5th, is election day. So we definitely encourage you guys to get out there and vote. And if you do need a voter register guide, we do have some available for you out in the uh, foyer on the information counter. And then, uh, ladies, if you want to mark your calendars, November 12th, you guys have a workshop coming up. And it's uh, a $5 cost, and we are still taking signups after the service. 
And then on November 24th, uh, that's the last day that we're collecting uh, the Operation Christmas Child boxes. And this morning, we actually have a video to show you. And so, I'll get out of the way. <laughs> Hey, this is Siante Kofi. I got my Operation Christmas Child Shoe Bus at the age of 12, which was so beautiful. And I love how God put all the pieces together today to make a beautiful story out of my life. I grew up from a very poor home. When I look back how God brought me so far, it amazes me because there's so much impact that these little shoe buses are making around the world. These pairs of shoes were a huge blessing from God to me back then because they fit me perfectly and not just fitting me, it was what I needed at that very moment and it's a huge blessing from God. And this letter was what made the whole difference in my life. Alex said, hi friend, my name is Alex Watkin, I'm eight years old and we live in New Jersey. I have a sister, Stephanie Watkin, and my dad is Keith Watkin, Donna Watkin, my mom. I'm glad to package your shoe bus. I would love to hear from you. And with this letter, I wrote back to Alice and I came to the United States and I reunited with the Watkins family. We had a beautiful time. And I was so overwhelmed when I came and I gave them a hug. It was the best time of my life. And I'm so grateful to God for them participating in the Operation Christmas Child shoe bus packing process. We'll get an awesome opportunity to bless the children all over the world. So we have some boxes out in the foyer. And uh, don't forget the last day to turn them in is November the 24th. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for your faithfulness to us, for giving us life, for giving us breath, for giving us hope in Jesus Christ. And Father, would you be exalted in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
Gracious Father, that's our, our song this morning, and that's our prayer, that, Lord, you would help us to be conformed more and more into your image and, and less and less of who we are, that you truly would be glorified in the hearts and lives of your children. We praise your holy name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome. God bless you guys. Why don't you turn and say hello to each other real quick. Well, it is good to be here with you guys this morning, and um, I'm hoping that you guys are here for the first service, but you'll, you'll come back for the uh, barbecue and baptism after the second service, and so uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, this morning, we're going to have a guest speaker, uh, my dear friend, Art Finney, and um, I could stand up here for quite a while and tell you stories and, and uh, introduce them really well, uh, but all I want to say is that... Uh, I was literally a, a, a cop on Friday and a kind of a pastor on Monday. And, uh, and I, you know, kind of came into ministry with uh, the cop attitude. And uh, uh, my, my dear friend and pastor, Art, was so patient and kind and loving. And, uh, and, and, and patient being like patient and really patient. And uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to have him come and speak to you guys and, uh, and share it. So, Art, would you come on up? It, he's going to be teaching on uh, the life of Asa, and we're handing out these uh, uh, outlines. And so if you didn't get one, raise your hand, and we'll make sure you get one of these outlines real quick. Thank you. Oh, good morning to all of you as well. Uh, I echo... Uh, Pastor Andrews, welcome, and Pastor Mike, and it is uh, just a real honor and a privilege uh, to be with you this morning. I don't say that lightly. I, I say that from the bottom of my heart. Um, the years that we have been serving the Lord alongside Mike and Grace uh, for many now, I mean, it's 25, 26 years though uh, Pastor Mike was at our fellowship in Valley Springs, California for seven, about seven years, I think, something like that, before the Lord called he and uh, Grace up here to bless Susanville with their presence and their desire to seek the Lord and encourage others to seek the Lord. So what a, what a joy to share with you today. Um, my wife, Sherry, we celebrate 35 years of marriage this coming January, and uh, we are just over the top blessed uh, in our family, in our household. Uh, I stand before you this morning to say to you, I know nothing except Christ and him crucified. That's what I know. 
And I'm convinced that uh, today I'll be sharing with you uh, one or more of, of three things. One, I'll probably share with you something you already know. Uh, two, I might share with you something that you knew but are being reminded of. And there's an odd chance that I might share with you something that you didn't know before. And so, with your Bible, if you have one, please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 12 first. And we're going to read a few verses in chapter 12, and we're going to go to chapter 13. Our study will begin in chapter 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 12. And can I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's Word? All right, I'm going to draw your attention uh, in chapter 12 to verse 13 and 14. Notice, it says, Thus King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. Now Rehoboam was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Nama, an Amoritess. Verse 14, and he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Now I'm going to draw your attention to chapter 13, the first two verses. Chapter 13, we read, in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, Abijah became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel of Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. One last reference, if you turn your eyes over to chapter 14, verse 1. And it says, So Abijah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. And in his days, the land was quiet for ten years. Will you pray with me? Father, so true is that your word is a living word and that it speaks to our heart. And this morning, Lord, we desire to be fed and nourished and strengthened by your word. As we have sung for you to teach us how to walk in your word, how to speak in your word, to live by your word. And so, Lord, would you, this morning, open your word to us that we might know what your good and perfect will in our lives individually and corporately would be. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Believing, I think, uh, your service, first service ends at 10. 10. And so there's a clock there. Um, there's a verse in the New Testament that has guided me uh, all throughout my study in the Old Testament for, for many years once I stumbled upon this verse. And it comes to us in the book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 4. The apostle Paul writes, he says, whatever things were written before, were written for our learning so that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Romans 15, 4. And the Apostle Paul writing in that letter uh, to the 
Christians in Rome, uh, you know, the book of Romans being like a, a theological deep, deep dive. But he was seeking to impart something to the Christians in Rome that, that what was written before in the Old Testament was written there for everyone to learn from. So that through those scriptures, you might turn this down a little bit, great. Everyone that would look to those scriptures would have patience and hope from those scriptures. You, you may recall, some of you have been reading your Bible for a while, that when Paul was writing this, they didn't hold in their hand the Old and New Testaments that you and I hold in our hand. In fact, the letters of the New Testament were in fact being written as he was speaking this. And those letters would travel on papyrus throughout the churches 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians. Colossians 4.16, uh, Paul wrote to the Christians in Colossae. He said, when this epistle is read, uh, see to it that it is read also to the church in Laodicea. So I'm just reminding us this morning that when Paul wrote and spoke that things that are written before are written for our learning, he was pointing to the Old Testament. Now, the New Testament, of course, is our record of the New Covenant. It is uh, established in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But the New Testament didn't, nor does it, replace the Old Testament. It fulfills it. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I came to annul or destroy the Old Testament. He said, I came to fulfill it. Having said that, similarly, as we look at the church today, the body of Christ at large, of which if you're a Christian this morning, if you're watching at home and you're a Christian this morning, the body of Christ today does not take the place of what was written to Israel in the Old Testament. That is what we call Reformed theology. And there are sects of the Christian body of Christ that believe, you know, all those Old Testament things are meant for the church today. And it's not true. The prophecies and the promises of the Old Testament not only apply to the church today, but they apply to Israel today and to every believer, both Jew, Gentile, Scythian, bond or free, that will place their faith in the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. And that Hebrews, Jews, one day will acknowledge Christ as their Messiah. So I, I say all of that to reinforce where we're going this morning. Since there is a promise from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament that what was written in the Old Testament was written for our learning, I've been prompted in the pleasure of coming to you this morning to take us through 2 Chronicles 14, 15, and 16 as we take lessons, learning lessons from the life of Asa. So, a little bit of background for Asa. I, I enjoy it. I hope you do as well. I think it's important for our study this morning. And that is, is that, you know, how do we get to Asa? Well, you go all the way back. God made a covenant with Abraham, right? And he made, through Abraham, a chosen people that were to carry the oracle of God to a dark world. From Abraham, that covenant was passed on to his lineage, Isaac, to Jacob, Jacob's sons. He had the 12, became the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel were uh, brought down into Egypt. They were in bondage there for 430 years. God raised up a deliverer named Moses, made a covenant with Moses called the Mosaic Covenant. We have the Abrahamic Covenant. We have the Mosaic Covenant. God raises up Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of bondage. 
they come to the base of Mount Sinai, they are given the law there, and then we find them uh, rejecting this law, wandering throughout the desert for 40 years, uh, and while they were wandering, and that initial generation would die off, and a new generation would be brought into the land of their promise, which is today Israel, isn't that amazing? Um, while they were wandering, they saw kings. And as fickle as we are as people sometimes, maybe not you, I'll speak for myself, but you know, you look around and you think, oh, that looks pretty good, I'll try that. And we, you know the story, they looked at kings around them and they decided instead of having God rule over us, a monarchy, uh, a theocracy rather, Let's have a king rule over us, and the king can be responsible to God. We'll just be responsible to the king. So they went from a theocracy to a monarchy. And they called out to their prophet Samuel, we want a king. And so God said, give them what they want. You know the history. The first king of Israel was Saul. Saul yes. And so they chose Saul. and. Saul did okay for a while, but then he transgressed and wasn't obedient to the Lord. And because he wasn't obedient to the Lord, the Lord said, I'm going to raise up another king who has my heart, a, king, a man after God's own heart, and his name was David. And so then David wanted to build God a, a, a place to dwell. He saw that, you know, the ark was still in tents and so he wanted to build a God a, a tabernacle and you will remember what happened the Lord said you're not going to build it but from your loins will come one who will build my house and his name was Solomon so we go from you know that history all the way to Solomon now Solomon began to have children and in Solomon's reign something interesting happens which brings us to Asa uh, in Solomon's reign, while Solomon was building and the temple was complete, he also decided to build uh, some, who here has been to Israel? Anyone? Hands up. Okay. And who, maybe you've studied Israel. Below Jerusalem is what's called the city of David. And so uh, the city of David was the beginnings of Jerusalem. So when Solomon built the temple, which exists today, actually destroyed then Zerubbabel's temple, which is in Jerusalem, while Solomon was doing that, he also decided to, to fortify areas, one called the Milo, M-I-L-L-O. And it was a, basically a wall that would stand as a, a fortification against enemies that would come. And the person that he used to oversee the building of the Milo was a man named Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam and Solomon had a conflict. They, they became in conflict with one another and Jeroboam rebelled against Solomon and he left to go down to Egypt. And while he was walking, a prophet named Ahijah met him on the road and took his garment off and gave it to Jeroboam. And he said, I want you to tear this garment into 12 pieces. And I want you to take 10 of those pieces and I will take two. For the kingdom of Israel is going to be torn apart and you will reign over 10 tribes. And so Jeroboam, believing and obeying this prophet's word, tore the garment, he took 10 pieces, Ahijah took two, Jeroboam went down to Egypt, he stayed there for a while. Solomon had Abijah, and then when Abijah, when, when Jeroboam heard that Abijah was now reigning after Solomon's death, he decided to come back and see if maybe he could find a place in this new uh, I'm sorry, Rehoboam, Solomon's first uh, successor. And so when Rehoboam was reigning, Jeroboam comes back and he comes into the presence of, of Rehoboam and he's 
hoping for a place in the kingdom. And he says, your father treated us really cruelly. But if you will treat us kindly, me and my people will serve you. And you can read about this uh, back in 2 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 11, sorry. But maybe you know the story. And what happened was Rehoboam, as a young ruler, and this is a word to all the young ones listening or watching, he said, well, Jeroboam, you go away. And what I'll do is I'm going to think about this, and you come back to me in a few days, and I'll let you know what my answer is. So he goes to the elders who were his counselors, Rehoboam, and he says, this is what Jeroboam wants me to do. What do you think I should do? And his elder counselors told him, you should treat him kindly. Don't be as cruel to him as, as Solomon was, and he'll serve you. There's wisdom in age. Can I get an amen? <laughs> there, is wisdom that, there is wisdom that can come with age. But Rehoboam rejected that. And he went to his younger counselors and he said, this is what Jeroboam wants. What do you think I should do? And the younger whippersnappers, of course, counseled him the other way and said, no, you be twice as cruel on him as Solomon was. And so when Rehoboam gave that information to Jeroboam, Guess what happened? The prophecy of Ahijah. Jeroboam rebelled and took 10 tribes to the north. One of the things that Rehoboam told Jeroboam, he says, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father, my father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. 1 Kings 11. And so Jeroboam leaves and he takes 10 tribes to the north of Jerusalem, north of Judah. And this is where, you Bible students, is where we come into that uh, time of Israel's history when there is a split in the kingdom. 10 to the north, two tribes to the south, Judah and Benjamin in the south, referred to often through the Old Testament as Judah, 10 tribes to the north, often referred to as Ephraim or Israel. And that can be confusing sometimes as you're reading through the Old Testament. I thought I was reading about Israel. Well, no, you're reading about the 10 tribes in the north. And what Jeroboam did in taking 10 tribes to the north, now all this is background, and well, I'm going to get there. What Jeroboam did in taking 10 tribes to the north is he told the people, he said, you know what? It's too hard for you to go all the way down to Jerusalem to worship God the three times a year that you are commanded to do so. Stay up here in the north with me. And he built, of all things, two golden calves and said to them, here are your gods, worship there. And if you've ever been to Israel, the, the Tell of Dan is still there. He built two places of worship, Bethel and Dan, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the servant of Solomon, the son of David, rose up and rebelled against his Lord. Then worthless rogues gathered to him and strengthened themselves against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, when Rehoboam was young and inexperienced and could not withstand them. Second Chronicles chapter 13. And Jeroboam made two golden calves, 1 Kings 12, 28, and said to the people, it's too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel and another he put in Dan. Now this thing became sin for the people went to worship before one as far as Dan. God says, do this. And his people or his leader says, no, you don't have to do that. Do this. So into this division of a nation, division of a people, division of leaders, division of a household. When we come to the study of Asa, it's important 
And I, I believe critical to our study uh, to know two things, two things. Number one, what Asa was born into, and secondly, what Asa lived through. And what he was born into, I've alluded to it, said some of it, he, he was born into uh, a grandfather who ruled harshly, Rehoboam, that eventually brought division in the entire nation. He was born into a divided household of worship. As an adult, he lived in the fallout of that division and the fallout of his grandfather, sin and favoritism. We read in the 11th chapter, 2 Chronicles, that Rehoboam loved Makkah, the granddaughter of Absalom, more than all his wives and his concubines, for he took 18 wives and 60 concubines and begot 28 sons and 60 daughters. And Rehoboam appointed Abijah, Asa's father, the son of Makkah as chief to be leader among his brothers for he intended to make him king. And in verse one of the 12th chapter, which I didn't have you read, in verse one of the 12th chapter of Second Chronicles, it says, now it came to pass that when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel along with him. Wow. I mean, Asa was born into trouble. He grew up in the midst of trouble. A grandfather that forsook the Lord, a father that forsook the Lord. And here comes Asa. Which begins how we learn from him. And so, I want you to look with me now to verse 2 of chapter 14. And I'm going to read down to verse 8. Verse 2 of chapter 14, it says, Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God, for he removed the altars of the foreign gods and the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images. He commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandments. And he also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah. Remember, we're talking the southern kingdom of Judah. And the kingdom was quiet under him. And he built fortified cities in Judah for the land had rest. He had no war in those years because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore, he said to Judah, let us build these cities and make walls around them and towers and gates and bars while the land is yet before us because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered and Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah who carried shields and spears and from Benjamin 280,000 men who carried shields and drew bows and these were mighty men of valor. First lesson that Asa teaches, God is looking for anyone who will do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. And he will use such an individual to initiate revival amongst his people. The first lesson that Asa teaches me, and this study came out of my own devotional reading, is that Asa initiated revival and brought blessing of God, the blessings of God afresh to his people because he was simply a man, an individual that would do good and what was right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. Removed foreign gods, broke down pillars, commanded others, hey, seek God, seek the Lord built, he built and rebuilt cities, towels, walls, towers, gates, and all of the rest that came into his leading chapter of his life at this time, he attributed to the Lord. The Lord has given us rest. 
How do we apply that? Simply, as I said, God is looking for you and me to do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord our God. It doesn't matter what you were born into. It doesn't matter what you've lived in. The past is the past. Today is today. And at any moment when an individual will say, you know what, that is, has nothing to do with me following after. That song was great. I love that. The, teach me to walk in your word. That has nothing to do with how I'm going to walk and serve you, Lord. Tremendous. Removing foreign gods, that might be a little, you know, well, how do I relate to that? Well, there's a lot of foreign uh, deities that are permeating our culture today. And John's letter tells us about the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Are we not, oh, man, we're pounded by media, we're pounded by culture about what is good and what is, you know, to be wanted by every American. And yet that's so contrary to what just the person of Christ being formed in us. To command others to seek the Lord, be someone who encourages others to be a God seeker. And we can't do that unless we ourselves first are God seekers to build and rebuild uh, our family. I mean, I said Sherry and I celebrate 35 years this coming January, but we've seen God do miracles in rebuilding things that were broken. God will do that. And we're responsible to attribute all of the goodness to the Lord. There's a second lesson that Asa teaches us, and it comes to us in verse 9 and 10. I draw your attention there. It says, then, that's an important word. You can circle that. It says, then Zerah, the Ethiopian, came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots, and he came to Merishah. So Asa went out against him, and they, meaning Asa and his individuals and Zerah and his army, they set the troops in battle array in the valley of Sephata at uh, Merashah. Now, historians have recorded this battle as being somewhere in between 924 and 884 BC, that Zerah was most likely a Nubian, a, a Sudanese general uh, in the army of the Pharaoh at this time would have been Pharaoh uh, Osokon, O-S-O-R-K-O-N. And something interesting to me is that, you know, Asa's in the middle of just great blessings going on, and then all of a sudden there's this trial. <laughs> it's like things are great, and then, whoa, wait a minute. There's an army out there that's twice as big as what I have. And the beauty of verse 10 is that it says, so Asa went out against him. Can we for a moment enter into the, the mind and the heart of Asa? He's like, he's obediently walking with the Lord. He's seeking to follow the Lord. I have no idea how I'm going to win this battle, but I'm just going to go out and set my men in battle array. That in itself is, is noteworthy and should be... Uh, Noted, but the point is, is that God allows trial in times of blessing. God allows trial in times of blessing. And you remember, I told you I'm going to share things with you that you already know. And I'm going to probably share with you things that you knew, but maybe can be reminded of. And here's one of those things. You, you probably already know this well in life experience that right in the middle of, of walking in some of the blessings that God's pouring out in your life, something comes in from left field and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? God allows it. Psalm, 1, Psalm 11 verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. 
So God will allow testing in times of trial. But make that distinction, beloved, this morning, that there is a difference between the testing of God and the tempting of the devil. There's to be a clear distinction. God does not tempt anyone. James tells us, let no one say that when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. God tests us. The devil, our adversary, God's adversary, seeks to tempt us. The difference being the Lord is seeking to bring out the Christ-likeness in us in those testings. The devil is seeking to bring out all the bad and the failure and the sin. Peter tells us, 1 Peter 1, 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Psalm 66, 10, for you, O God, have tested us and have refined us as silver is refined. I'm sure Pastor Mike is such a great Bible teacher, he's probably shared with you multiple times the, the illustration, the truthful illustration of, of a jeweler when they are endeavoring to uh, create pure gold. That what they do is they take raw ore and they put it under a fire, a heat. And they raise that fire to a given temperature until some of the ore, the dross, begins to fall off. And there's, there's the gold, but then they, they take that liquid and the dross rises to the top and it is scooped off and thrown away. And then that same liquid is put into a fire, only this time heated even hotter. And with each raising of the temperature, more dross rises to the top. And with each process, the jeweler is scooping off the dross until he gets that gold pure. And how he knows it's pure is when the liquid gold, he can look in it and he can see his reflection in the gold. And God does that in our life. He raises the temperature. Lord, no, don't raise it hotter. He says, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to find the, the reflection of Christ in you. Oh, Lord. Trial in times of testing. Asa teaches us. But he teaches us a third lesson. That when those trials come, at this time in his life, he knew where to turn. Look at verse 11, classic verse in the Old Testament, worth memorizing every one of us, right? Verse 11, and Asa cried out to the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Hallelujah. I mean, Asa's third lesson this morning is that in times of trial, he knew where to turn. To rely solely on the Lord. Do you have a need in your life? Rely on the Lord. Does it look impossible? Rely on the Lord. Does it look like the, the need is, is three, five, 20 times greater than the resource? Hey, God, it's, it's not difficult. It's not impossible for you to work with many or few. I love it. So to recap, these first three lessons that are given to us in chapter 14 is that God is always looking for someone who will do what is good and right in his eyes and use that individual to initiate revival in their own heart first and in the lives of those around them. Secondly, the Lord allows testing in times of blessing. And thirdly, 
to know where to turn in those times of blessing. The fourth lesson that Asa teaches us comes to us now in the 15th chapter. And I'll draw your attention to chapter 15. Uh, well, well, let's back up a little bit. I don't want to miss anything here. Verse 12 of uh, chapter 14. So the Lord struck the Ethiopians before Asa and Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people who were with him pursued them to Gerar, so the Ethiopians were overthrown, and they could uh, not recover, for they were broken before the Lord and his army, and they carried away very much spoil. Then they defeated all the cities around Gerar, for the fear of the Lord came upon them, and they plundered all the cities, for there was an exceedingly much spoil in them. They also attacked the livestock enclosures and carried off sheep and camels in abundance and returned to Jerusalem. Bottom line, victory, right? Turn to the Lord and watch him be victorious. Now, this next lesson, chapter 15, verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded. And he went out to meet Asa, and he said to him, quote, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel had been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation, and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you, this is where it begins to transition, the prophet is speaking to Asa, he says, but you be strong, and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And in verse 8, and when Asa heard these words, and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim and restored the altar of the Lord that was before the vegetable of the Lord there in Jerusalem. We'll stop there for a minute. The prophet's main point to Asa in coming to him right after the victory in this battle is to exhort Asa to keep abiding in the Lord. After all, Asa would have been flush with possible pride. Hey, look what God did. And he could start to walk in this assumed uh, expectation that we're just always going to have the favor of the Lord. Let's just, you know, go on with life as normal. God's going to give us his favor. And the prophet comes along and says, Asa, wait a minute. If you seek him, you will find him. While you are with him, he is with you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now, We'll get to this fifth point is that Asa was, Asa gained great courage by the exhortation to abide. He gained great courage in the exhortation to remain abiding. And in that abiding, he makes changes all throughout the kingdom. But I want to take your attention to uh, verse 2 for a moment. There's there's an interesting thing here that really relates to us as New Testament believers. When we read in verse 2 that the prophet is saying to Asa, the Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. That stopped me when I read that. I don't know if you've ever 
read in your New Testament all the way over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, the author of Hebrews reminds us that, that Jesus has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So as a Christian, I'm reading this in the text. I'm going, wait a minute. Is there a conflict? Is the Bible conflict, you know, uh, conflicting itself one another? And this is where I encourage um, uh, study, you know, certain books that we can have. We can get dictionaries, concordances. We can begin to break down the word of God. If, we, if we'll just take the time to stop and begin to parse what's in there and how the Lord can speak to us in those ways. So I, I thought to myself, well, wait a minute, this word forsake, what does it really mean here? What does it really mean in Hebrews 11.5? And the answer in the definition helps me define what not only the prophet is saying to Asa, but what the Lord is saying really to everyone who will read this. The definition of the word forsake here in 2 Chronicles 15 is a Hebrew word and it comes from a root word that means to loosen, relinquish, or permit. To loosen, relinquish, or permit. In other words, Asa, if, if you decide to loosen your grip on God Almighty, if you decide to relinquish this exhortation to keep abiding and you permit yourself to just kind of walk in your own way, then the Lord will loosen his grip on you, relinquish his favor and oversight on you, and permit you to go your way. Bottom line, it's an argument for free will, right? God gave each of us a free will and he will not coerce us into obeying him or pursuing him or abiding in him. It comes from a desire in the heart that is uh, prompted by a work of the Holy Spirit. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll take that. And then I go over to Hebrews 11.5, where the author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus said, he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the word in Hebrews 11.5 is a, a Greek word, and its root meaning is this, leave behind in some place or desert. So in the New Testament, Jesus promises, I'll never leave you behind or desert you. And beloved, if I you know, could share with you this morning how important those two definitions are, how critical they are to our faith this morning. I mean, I know in my own life, I was thinking about sharing a, a man in our fellowship just this last Wednesday night, he was talking about his testimony in Germany, how he came to faith in Christ at one age and, and then walked away. <clears throat> but I thought I'd share with you briefly my own testimony as well. Um, growing up in a, a single mom home, my brother and I, wayward kids, growing up in Oakland, California. And on the invite of someone I go to, a summer youth camp, had no idea what church or Christ or any of that was like. My mom, uh, in her early years, had been to church, but she didn't raise us in, in the Lord. And I go to this Christian camp one summer as a 15-year-old, and all week long, I, I, I'm going to Bible studies, I'm going to games with my friends and everything, and I'm hearing the Word of God, hearing the Word of God, hearing the Word of God. And come Friday night, when all these 300 kids are brought to an amphitheater and there's a campfire. This evangelist named Ken Poor stands up and gives the gospel message and he says, and if you want to be sure you're going to heaven, then I'm going to ask you right now to raise your hand. Do you want to know that you will go to heaven when you die? Up went my hand. And he says, now if your hand is raised, I want you to stand. 
And so I stood, and there was a handful of teenagers that stood with us. And he said, if you're standing, I want you to walk out the aisle and come down to this campfire. And we did, and Ken Poor led us in a prayer of receiving Christ as our Savior, forgiving us of our sin, and promising to be our Lord for the rest of our life. Amen? All right. So I drive down the hill from that camp. I went back to my buddies. I said, hey, I met Jesus. And they're like, have a joint, you, you, you know. And unfortunately, here's a, the importance of follow-up and discipleship. I, I had gone to this camp living in Oakland. The church that I went with was way over in Castro Valley. Now, no fault of theirs, but there was no follow-up in my life. No one came back and said, hey, let's, let's get you into the Bible. Let's get you reading about what you've just done. And so when I went back to my carousing friends, it wasn't long before my life plummeted again back into drug addiction, alcohol, and horrible things. Thirteen years of destruction. And I pray that that's not anybody's testimony here. I remember at one point driving early in the morning, having been up for several days, crashing into a stop sign and the, the four by four post came through the windshield and missed my head by a foot, shattered the windshield. I pulled the car over to the side and was eventually towed away and got out of that scenario. But it, it begs the question, having committed my life to Christ at 15, throughout those 13 years of wandering, if I had died that day, would I have gone to heaven? Did Christ leave me or did I leave Christ? And 13 years later, bankrupt of any purpose in my life, bankrupt of, of meaning and wholeness and realizing that I just driven the truck of this life completely out of control. I found myself camping in Yosemite one night at a campfire and I said, God, I am out of control. And if you are real, Jesus, will you come into my life afresh and take over? I was 27. And the phrase is often I rededicated my life to Christ and been walking with him since then. Amen. Why do I share that with you? It's because has, have any of you considered walking away? Perhaps you, you had walked away and come back and you wonder where was the Lord in that? Well, he was right there just like when you're ready, I'll embrace you and open my arms and take you into the fold. And what happens when that takes place in our lives is what took place in Asa's life is he gained such courage by abiding in Christ, walking with, well, with the Lord. It would have been God the Father in his dispensation that he began to make changes. Want to know what he changed? Look at verse 8. We read it. He, he makes changes all throughout the land of Judah, the mountains of Ephraim, he restored the altar of the Lord at the vestibule there in Jerusalem, verse nine, excuse me, verse nine. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them in Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon, for they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. The ten tribes in the north, some of them started coming down. Hey, when you commit your life to Christ, you will begin to affect the lives of those in your sphere of influence. They started coming down from the north and they gathered together at Jerusalem, verse 10, and in the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Asa, and they offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls, 7,000 sheep, 
from spoil they had brought. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman, to clarify the covenant that they're seeking to enter into was again that same covenant at the base of Mount Sinai, that those who would not seek the Lord would be cut off. Then they took an oath, verse 14, before the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and rams and horns. Uh, sometimes when you get excited about the Lord and what God is doing in your life, you know, it's, it's shouts and it's, look what God's doing, it's shouts and shouts. But as time goes on, we're going to see something. Verse 15, and Judah rejoiced at the oath for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them and the Lord gave them rest all around. And he, Asa, verse 16, removed uh, Makah, the mother of Asa, the king, from, from being queen mother. Actually, the Hebrew means grandmother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah and Asa cut down her obscene image and crushed and burned it by the brook Kidron. And, but the high places were not removed from Israel way up north. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days, and he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils, and there was no war until the 35th year of the reign of Asa. Important point, fourth point, by abiding, we gain courage and strength to make changes in our lives and to encourage changes in the lives of those around us. Asa initiated revival. He was tested in times of blessing. He knew where to turn. He was exhorted to abide and made changes. We come now to a handful of lessons in the 16th chapter. Notice verse 1 of 16. I'll try and wind us up here. Verse 1 of chapter 16, it says that in the 36th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Okay, remember the, the distance of time here? It's 21 years later from chapter 15. 21 years later after the shout, Lord, we're going to serve you, after all the changes, all of the, the exhortation, life just starts to take on a normalcy. And in that routine of life is where the abiding is most necessary. Yes, there are high mountains, but there are low valleys. And it is the constance of abiding that is so important, beloved, all throughout our days once we begin with the Lord. And it's, it's 21 years later, and now there's a new king in the ten tribes of the north, and that king, Basha, decides to come down to the south of Judah and fortify or build a city, Ramah, that was the major trade route going in and out of the, the uh, area of Judah and Jerusalem. So if Basha could take control of that city, he would basically keep anyone from leaving or going in to Judah and they would, they would conquer and so here it is again in Asa's reign that a challenge comes. And notice what happens. Verse 2, Then Asa brought silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, 
I have sent you silver and gold. Come, break your treaty with Basha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad, heeding King Asa, and sent the captains of his army against the cities of Israel. They attacked Ejon, Dan, Abel, Mayim, and all the stored cities of Naphtali. And now it happened that when Basha heard it, that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah and they carried away the, uh, the stones and timber of Ramah, which Basha had used for building. And with them, he built Geba and Mizpah. So it sounds like maybe there was an initial victory here, right? But I want you to pay attention to two, two differences. In chapter 15, verse 18, Asa is bringing in gold and silver into the house of the Lord. In verse 2 of chapter 16, Asa is taking out silver and gold from the house of the Lord, and he's giving it to a pagan king, Hadad of Syria. What happened? The fifth lesson Asa teaches us is that his wavering faith in wavering faith, he sought help from the arm of the flesh. He forgot to abide. He forgot about the benefits of the Lord. Psalm 103, verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Psalm 116, verse 12, What should I render to the Lord for all he has done for me and the benefits he has given? We are not to forget how good, how faithful, how constant our God has been to us. And Asa, somewhere in that 21-year period, stopped. And when the challenge came, instead of relying on the Lord, as we read in uh, that previous chapter, he turns to the arm of the flesh in the form of King Ben-Hadad. Well... There's a sixth lesson. We're going to wind it up here within the next 10 minutes because I have eight total, so I've got to get through a couple more. Sixth lesson comes to us in verse 7 through 9, and the lesson is sometimes there's a need for reminding. Verse 7, And at that time Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God. Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very much chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes, another classic verse, beloved, Highlight it, mark it on your Bible, mark it on the Bible of the person next to you. Put it in your heart. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. Stop there. Fifth lesson. Sometimes there's a need to be reminded. And here God brings this prophet to remind Asa, hey, was it not enough when there was victory over the Ethiopians? But when you came to this challenge, you relied on the arm of the flesh. So now there's going to be a consequence to your choice. And how many of us this morning will, you know, echo that very true principle, there are consequences to your choices. <laughs> you, you, we tell our children that all the time, right? We give them an the opportunity to make a choice, and if they make a wrong choice, then we are responsible to discipline them and teach them there, there are consequences to your choices. But that goes on all throughout our life, my dear. Just a couple weeks ago, um, in the middle of that 
last heat wave we had, uh, one of our daughters, Julie, down in Plymouth, she has a, a, um, a fifth wheel that she uses for her annual Amador County Fair. And the top of it was ruined. It had been, you know, fallen apart. It was leaking and everything. And so I promised Julie, I said, sweetheart, I'll, I'll come and uh, repair that roof for you. Get some special tape, go around all the pop-ups, put a new rubber coat on it and everything. You know, just I wanted to do it. Well, life happened and then we got to this week and I had purposed that this was the week I was going to do it. But that was the week that it was like 98 degrees. And I'm thinking, I got to go up on that roof in 98 degrees. And, and oh no, Julie, it's just going to be really hot. So I'm not going to come this week. I'll come next week when the weather changes. My choice. So we get past that week. And sure enough, I don't know if it did, I don't know if it happened up here or not, but down there what happened is the weather turned a little bit and it was warm on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, but then all of a sudden there was a forecast for rain on Wednesday, Thursday. And I thought, man, I better get up there. So over Monday or whatever it was, I go over, I get my stuff and I'm putting all the tape down. Got one fresh coat on, took me two days, I think. And so on Wednesday, I put that coat down and it's like, Three o'clock in the afternoon, it's still fairly warm. I'm thinking, whew, did it. And sure enough, that night, it rained. And it rained harder in Plymouth than it rained in Ione. And I, when I went over there the next few days to put on the second coat, I would climb up that ladder, and I look, and that first coat was destroyed. It was like holes and pockets everywhere. And someone asked me, how's it going, Grandpa? And I said, your, con your choices have consequences. <laughs> you know, they do. And his choice here had a consequence that now that there would be war. Because the eyes of the Lord are really going to and fro the earth. They're looking for anyone whose heart will be loyal to him. And when a consequence for a choice that isn't real pleasing to God, when there's a choice we make that, that isn't the heart of God or just deviates a bit from the purposes of God in our life, beloved, there's, there's a consequence for that choice. And we have a responsibility of how we will respond to that consequence. I'm going to have to wind this up really quick here. The seventh lesson that Asa teaches is that there are two responses to correction from God. Notice verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison for he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Some very wise man years ago once told me there are two responses to knowing sin in our life. One is repentance. The other is justification. When God brings to our awareness of a change that he wants to make in our heart, your heart, we have a responsibility to respond to that information. One more piece of information and we have really only two ways that we can respond. One is to repent. Lord, I, I receive it. I repent of it. And by your grace and by the work of your Holy Spirit, I'll make that change. The other is to justify the error. Well, oh Lord, it wasn't that bad. Or Two responses to sin, repentance or justification. Ace's response was anger, enraged, and oppressing others. Watch out if you become angry with others. Watch out if you become exceedingly angry, enraged. Maybe God's seeking to bring something to the surface that he wants to deal with in his grace. Eighth point, last point this morning, comes to us in verses 11 and forward, it says, now that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel, and in the 39th year of his reign, 
Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady, malady was severe. Notice this last phrase. Yet in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. And so Asa rested with his fathers, and he died in the 40th year of his reign, and they buried him in his own tomb, which he had made for himself in the city of David. And they laid him in the bed, which was filled with spices and various ingredients prepared in a mixture of ointments. They made a very great burning for him. Here's that last point, and it's a sad one, that Asa ends up with a disappointing end and an unrealized potential. Asa ends up with a disappointing end and an unrealized potential. He forgot who to turn to. He forgot to remain to abide. And this is one of those studies that you would rather read it from the end to the beginning. You'd rather read how this guy saw what he needed to do and ended up doing it, which happens in the beginning, but his end is a disappointing one and an unrealized potential. I ask you this morning and put it before you. Do you see yourself in any one of these points? Are any one of these points applicable to where you are this morning, having walked into this church service, having watching at home? That God wants, has been pressing you to do what is right and good in his eyes because he wants to initiate revival. Maybe you're in a time of testing and right in the middle of blessing. Maybe you've turned to him and reminded him that it's not difficult for him by few or with many. Perhaps you're wrestling with a wavering faith that over the long haul, you're beginning to wonder. And this is a word of remembrance this morning. It's a gentle reminder that there are two responses to what God wants to do in our lives. Let's not have a disappointing end, but let's do well, that we might hear those words from our Savior, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Will you pray with me as we close? Precious Lord, you know each one of us this hour. You know our hearts. You, you're intimately involved with each of our lives. And as we have walked through the life of Asa, we, we simply ask that in whatever way you want to deal with our lives, in any of these ways that we have seen you deal with the life of Asa, that we would find ourselves this morning saying to you, have your way. We submit to the authority of this Holy Spirit. We welcome the embrace of a resurrected Savior. And we desire that your, your life, Jesus, would be lived out in us, that others might see Christ in us in these times in which we live. Thank you for your word, Lord. We commit ourselves to your fresh, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Would you stand with me, please?
gracious Father, we thank you for your word to us today. We thank you, Lord, for drawing us to yourself. And, and Lord, as we, as we learn today, help us, Lord, not just to start well, but to finish well. Lord, and to always look to you. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. Be glorified, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Well, God bless you guys. I pray the Lord continues to speak to you and to minister to you and just to, to wash over you with his love and his grace and he loves you so much. God bless you guys. Uh, have a great day. Come back for the uh, baptism later on or hang out and talk to Pastor Art and Sherry, and uh, they'd love to talk with you. So we'll see you again soon. And if you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We would love to pray with you.